them like for the next step, several levels of networks is the old school based control. You, you have two base levels of complexity. One that you heard a lot this morning, what we call the molecular complexity, based how complex how the things do, how the things fold, how they interact, okay? But then you have what we call the complexity the level of network. And even in the level of the protein, you notice that basically by creating by creating combinatorics of these things, you can actually, using a few motifs, create lots of different things. By the time you do dimers and tetramers or domain swapping and stuff like that, you can use the same protein motif and create many different levels of functionality using the same motif. That's the way the base nature is going to waste it, right? And then you put the DNA in the game, you do these things. So in a sense, you start to observe that uh, it is an interesting thing. Uh, there's a problem that we haven't solved, or we don't have solved, but for, for people to think about it, basically, is the question how these things actually take place. How do we recruit more proteins? How do we do that? How do these things don't end up being like a... If I have to put three proteins together, you start to put the probability of these things coming together at the same time, this, this number is going to go, become very small, this probability is very fast. So, there was an interesting way to go saying how one protein first binds stronger, then the other one is weaker, and gets doing these things. And you can start to see sequential mechanisms between the network and the molecular part. Like you show some genes where sometimes you produce things and basically genetic product is done in a time order by the same by the same activator in a, in a way. So there are lots of interesting things that's interesting for people that are the new generation coming towards biological things. That's, that's a lot of work. beautiful. See, many of us will be focused on noise more and stuff is work, but you can pull many, many problems as, as you come along this way. Uh, I, I think there's 
insights that you can you know, can Well, just as a comment, sorry, I'm thinking I will tell you that the energy landscape of proteins are much, much steeper than whatever we are going to call it. These are going to have many attractors over here and yeah, that, would, that would correspond to the, diff the different states of the, of the cell that the cell can operate. Protein folding, your are your close to the You're just, you, you, can, you can treat as basic temperature means something. Here the systems are far from the liberal. And as soon as you start to get out of your libro, he, he's going to tell you in the next lecture a few, a few of the tricks that you have to start to, do, to deal with that. But then all our physics training is gone. Remember that basic, if you look at statistical physics these days, what you have is, okay, we can solve equilibrium, right? Then I write a big book on non-equilibrium statistical physics and all I'm doing is a minor perturbation around equilibrium. That's why we have universality and critical exponents and stuff like that. But by the time you put a little more energy in the system and you start to break more symmetries and start to go into you know, you computational limits, that's all open territory. It's a beautiful problem. That's really, uh, I think that's an interesting thing to raise here. I'm glad that you asked because it tells you not only using physics, so there's, and that's the real meaning of biological physics. Daniel said that you didn't know what I meant, but that's what time on comes. Not just using the physics that we know to try to help as a tool to try to understand a biological problem, but as soon as you face with a biological problem, say, I don't want enough physics to solve this problem. Then you have to feed back right. and develop new physics and new tools to go after your biological. So it's, it's, it's a route. That's why I like to call biological physics because some way, one way you're using physics, one way to attack biology, but the other time, biology becomes the paradigm of the real complex system. That I think is going to create all the modern statistical, whatever we call statistical physics in the future. And in this way, I think that's where being a physicist becomes interesting, right? Because, you know, if you do physics, if you're a theoretician or if you're a experiment, it's always the same too. You have your bag of tricks, and every time you see a problem, you try to see which of my tricks fit on that problem, right? So they're the equation. But here, you start to face the equation you, want, you don't know how to solve, right? So I think that's the beauty of it of the field, not only for the life science, but actually for, for physics itself. Yeah, I uh, want uh, another thing to add uh, on the first approach is that uh, before these techniques, uh, if, you, if you want to see the expression of uh, any kind of protein in the cell, you have to kill all the cells and, and, and then run the cells and, and, and see how many uh, how much protein they had there. But now, with this, uh, with this technique, you can actually, uh, you don't have to kill the cell. You, you just shine light on it and you see the concentration of the protein there and with the living cell. So there's a, you, 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 can, you can see real time. You don't, you don't have to kill the cell. So as a caveat though, that you want to make sure that you find the GFP that you're not sending a lot of money. Yeah. I think that's a good comment, Daniel. There are lots of caveats, but they're always more subtle than killing. <laughs> <laughs> killing is quite common. <laughs>
what you, what, what do you get in a bacteria genome that you don't get and that you, that you don't get in a, in the randomized in the random network, right? So 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 this kind of stuff shows up like ten every time you know, in the in the, in the bacteria genome than in the random network. That's uh, and then there's the same um, you know, speculation of why why is that? What do they do? I don't know. If, uh, I mean, if, 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 even even a small one. But there, you know, of course, if you if you change the rates, and you can you can you spend a whole lot of time studying like some, something as 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 simple as, as this. Well, at the end of the day, okay. The question you have, the question is we are going to go for the same. But it's good to have one one comment at the end of the time. Remember what's known, right? Right? So the question is, where is the state of art? He said, let's re-emphasize that, basically. When you say that you have a full network of a protein, that they can draw it, they can do all these big things, that comes that they, the network is drawn because someone made some rule that can be by knockout chaining or by other techniques, they believe if two proteins kiss each other, then I, I draw a connection. That's how this network's done. There's not really too much dynamics. It comes from this big expression technique. So there's lots of questions based when you draw the initial network where this one are drawn, that basically you have you have lines connecting points, but they, in some cases you don't have directions and you don't have intensities there yet. So that's the thing we're trying to become more data with these things. That's why that's a new field, that's beautiful, because a lot of these conclusions are made on a very qualitative basis, right? That they, and why you say to things connect each other or not comes on a sort of a. <laughs> by the time you run some uh, techniques like a uh, DNA array, if the, if this is shy enough. I say yes, not shy enough. But, but even enough is a good question, right? Because you, you have to draw a line in there. So I think it's very important to remember that uh, uh, what he said when you work on a few genes. You, you have systems that basically you have like overall general statements that then you look at those connections and you see that some of those connections appear to be much more likely than you expect of just a random connectivity level and that's where these conclusions come. But these are very qualitative or overall general things. And the other hand that you're going to see and he starts to say situations where now a lot of people are moving in and getting just a very small number of genes, very well set on genes, and see if we can really understand that deeply and to figure out all these things all these things work. And, uh, and there are two cultures here. There are even people trying to make artificial circuits for the fun of it. Doesn't mean, and just see if you can do that. That's another. Well, the repress layer is kind of the canonical example. Canonical example of that. Well, just one more comment. Yeah. And uh, especially for the cardiac cell. Because all these days on. The protein secret, but there are a lot of uh, RNAs involved. And, and, and yeah, so but I think eight percent of the or nine percent of the genome. You are late. There's a lot of uh, yeah, yeah. But if you go back to the first slide, you show us what to do to go back. But this is repetition as a verb. Is the fact that they exactly this one's good. See, the great thing about bacteria is that, uh, first of all, every, you, you don't need to get out of the nucleus and get, so all the complexity level in the eukaryotes is up, basically. You already have enough trouble in the bacteria that you go to the eukaryotes and you do that. You have the luxury, like we said with GFP, but with a single promoter, you can control two genes. You cannot do that in a eukaryote cell either. So GFP trick, if you want to switch that to eukaryotes, it's going to take a lot of more work than you can do the bacteria, but you can just put one protein after another, and about the system, that's that's a luxury you have there. there so it's very lots of so so it's a sort of the system where you can actually do these things. And uh, we hope that all these conclusions will be transferred to, to things. The other thing is, in terms of mathematics, by the time you put on the cell and have got off the cell and things like that, you have more and more time delays. And if you have dealt with the system of French equations, you don't know there's nothing more traumatized than time delays. They make your life fairly miserable, very fast, right? Even in simulations, to understand what's going on. So it's like a, it's to figure out what's going on. So anyway.
um, as uh, Justin mentioned, I am a experimentalist and uh, a biochemist. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, today I would like to discuss with you some aspects mm -hmm. of um, protein structure determination dynamics using mm -hmm. NMR and um, show you some examples, some applications and uh, how we can get insights and how we can get problems from the biological system. So that's what we do, so we get problems from, to try to solve them. And uh, so everything starts when you place a nucleus in the in a strong magnetic, magnetic field and uh, if this nucleus has a spin, you to, it will orient so it will interact with the magnetic field and uh, here in this um, uh, um, uh, it's representing uh, uh, a nucleus with a spin half so it can get two orientations the magnetic field spin one it gets three so one and uh, usually we study nucleus with a spin half uh, maybe when you want to do structure the donation because it's easier to work with and uh, uh, in this magnetic field, it not only orients, but uh, it will process uh, in a frequency that depends on the uh, magnetic field and also the properties of the nucleus that's represented by the gamma, that the magnetic shape ratio. And um, so this will be, I mean, the basic, of course, we don't have time to, to deal with all of this. Today, so I want to focus uh, in uh, the structure determination process. So, what you got to do uh, in order to determine the structure of a protein? Uh, so, the first the first problem we have to face is the biochemical work. So, usually, an NMR lab works in collaboration with other biochemical laboratories because uh, this biochemical work can be really hard. Uh, we usually uh, use high concentrations of protein and uh, frequently we need uh, labeling so we need the, the, the clone protein. So this can take quite some time and the next step then when the protein is ready so you face the assignment problem. So this uh, step will, will uh, <coughs> is the recording and processing of all the mass spectra and that means that you have to know uh, the frequency of every atom of the protein. And after that, you can extract uh, restraints, experimental restraints uh, that are mainly NOEs, the hydro angles from J couplings. And then you're ready to start your structure calculation. And, uh, uh, and then it's, the, it's where the fun starts, when you get the structure, and then you can try to understand some uh, function problems uh, based on the on the uh, function problems based on the structure and uh, uh, relaxation measurements can help us a lot so for you to understand the assignment problem I'm showing here uh, hydrogen spectrum of uh, protein so you can see uh, many peaks uh, most of them are not uh, resolved uh, but uh, the assignment to really calculate the structure, you need to know uh, every single peak in this spectra, and also that's the hydrogen, the carbon, the nitrogen, so you have to know everything about the protein. There are different strategies that you can use uh, in order to get this assignment, and uh, they are uh, based um, mostly in the size of the protein. So if you have a small protein, if you have five kilodalton, you can see that you can use uh, on nuclear, that means you're using just the hydrogen. But uh, as soon as the, your protein increases, you can see that you start to use more elaborate techniques and you, use to, you have to use a nuclear experiments, and that's when you need the, uh, the labeled samples with nitrogen 15, carbon 13, and nowadays even deuterium. And uh, uh, if you have a really, what's called a really big protein for NMR spectroscopy, that will be around uh, 25, 30 kilodalton, then you need uh, an even more sophisticated uh, strategy using the TROSE experiments, developed by the group of Kurt Kurtish. 
So just for you to have an idea, I'm showing here a scheme of what we call a 2D experiment. So the other one I showed you is uh, just uh, it's showing one uh, frequency dimension. And uh, what we call a 2D experiment is that you have a, a full sequence scheme will show a preparation, a T1 evolution time, a mixing time, and another T2, another time for evolution. That means that while you evolve uh, in T1 and T2, when you record in T2, you label the magnetization with uh, something that happens here. So by the end, you have two time domains that you can transform into frequency domains. And uh, that means that when you have a peak, you can now correlate one thing that happens in one evolution time domain with the other evolution time domain. For instance, if you are here, uh, uh, it's not the case, but you can have, for instance, correlation with the nitrogen and proton and so on. Uh, so here I'm showing uh, a nose spectrum. So this is called the Vukovic approach. It's where you use only uh, on nuclear experiments. And uh, in, this, uh, in this time of scheme, you have also the preparation, the, the mixing, the first T1 domain, the mixing time, and the T2 domain. And what happens is that uh, during this um, mixing time in the T1 domain, you label the magnetization both with uh, the chemical shift of the problem, but also with uh, 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 dipolar couplings. That means if you have a peak, that means that they are close together. I'm, I'm going to show another, uh, another uh, figure that I can explain better. Uh, this Vultrich approach is also based in uh, what's called the TOX experiment. That's then that correlation is based on the skull coupling and then the peaks that appear in the spectrum uh, are due to uh, correlation through the, uh, the covalent bond. So this way you can have all uh, the peaks from an amino acid. So here we have a glycine and you know, that can hit a volume. So you have all the hydrogens that uh, compose this, this amino acid. So this is part of the assignment. So now I know where is the frequency of the nitrogen, the amide of nitrogen, and the alphas, for instance. So this is the information we need uh, to fully understand the nose spectrum. We can uh, clearly see that if you have a simple molecule, then it's easy. So you can just follow what we call the spin systems uh, because you have few peaks. But of course, if you increase the, the oh sorry, the, let me just, so here it's uh, again the, the nose strategy where you have the, uh, the dipole interaction between the hydrogens that are less than five and strongs apart. And then uh, you can see now uh, some, uh, a two amino acid system where you can follow the toxic peaks that will be the intra uh, residue peaks, and also you have the inter residue uh, peaks. And now you can fully you can walk through the backbone and then assign all the in this case hydrogens of the molecule. Uh, it's good to know then that uh, the structure determination is mainly based in the hydrogen in the lead. Can you just tell me the couple of the acronyms? So I know NOE stands for nuclear overhead. How's that mean that? Yes. Why and that stands for? So spectroscopy. So will be, yes. And that the other one, talks. I'm sorry. That's okay. Talks will be the total uh, correlation spectroscopy. Got it. So yes, you're going to see that anyone loves this kind of. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so here is just an example. Sorry. And I'm showing um, a part of the nose spectra. So this is a, a real spectra. So this is a, a very small protein. It's 46 amino acids. And maybe you can um, maybe realize how difficult it is. So you have to know uh, every peak of this um, spectra you have to assign to a a specific hydrogen, so this can be uh, a really uh, time consuming. And uh, these peaks will appear, as I said, when, uh, when these hydrogen are less than five atoms apart. So here schematically, what you see, you have now, by, by the end of the day, you have a matrix of distance restraints 
go uh, between each of these uh, hydrogens. And then you have the primary sequence, and what you do then is try to validate all these NOEs in a single structure. So as I said, it is a real spectrum, the protein is called pisosaptivum, the protein one. And uh, here is the structure that you can calculate. So you can see here that it's a, a small protein, so you can use just on nuclear experiments uh, to solve the structure. Uh, just a few details, so it has uh, four of five arms that are here represented in yellow, and this is our plant fencing. I'm going to show her. Uh, Can I ask a question? Can you back up to the sure. image of the data? So when you have those, yeah, so when you have the sort of long yeah, um, so here, stars, the, but also in the, the, the horizontal ones up above. Oh, sorry, yeah. these, these lines? No, no, the, like, uh, oh, here. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So does that make for some difficulty in? Exactly. Yeah. So the, uh, in this uh, in this sample, these things are uh, artifacts. So there are there is something there. We actually don't know exactly what it is, but it's probably because it's pre-fine using TFA. So maybe we don't know exactly. So there is something that appears in the spectrum. So this is a real spectrum, let's say. And uh, there are uh, I'm gonna uh, I, I was going to tell later, but uh, anyway. What you have here is like a puzzle. So you have the yeah. structure, and then you have all the things. So what you do you need to do is to solve the puzzle. So there are several people, that have several groups, trying to to do it automatically. And that the problems that the, the spectrum is real, so sometimes it's hard to identify what's a real peak because if you uh, you can see there are very small peaks, and then the dosy uh, spectrum, these are the ones probably that represent long range anomalies that are the most important ones. So uh, they, it's evolving very rapidly, but still there are some difficulties due to these effects. <laughs> okay, so if you increase the size of a protein, it's obvious that you can understand uh, the spectra uh, as a 2D. So what um, um, several groups developed, including Advax and uh, Louis K, and uh, uh, also. So they develop different schemes. So what they do, you increase the number of time evolution. And each time of evolution now will uh, represent like a donation. So what you can do, you can then have different labels. I mean, uh, if the magnetization will be labeled with different information from the sample. I think it will be clear. And uh, the analysis uh, is then, uh, uh, then in using strips. So now you have different dimensions and each uh, dimension or each uh, uh, 2D plane will represent a, a type of information. So let me, I think it will be clear now. So this uh, is an example of a triple resonance experiment. It's the, the time of a 3D experiment. So what you do, you use the coupling between these, uh, these atoms and what you can do then is to make the magnetization travel through each uh, atom, and then you label uh, with uh, the chemical shift of these atoms. And you can see here that you can use the NH of one amino acid and label it with the uh, chemical shift with the amino acid that's before in the primary sequence. So you're going to have a pick of, uh, in this plane, NH, a peak with the intra uh, residue carbon of alpha carbon and with the next one. This way you can uh, walk through uh, the, the backbone. Uh, you, you usually work with pairs because uh, this peak uh, is usually weak, so you can have another one, another uh, very similar type of experiment. You need to have uh, this peak, the, the, the sequence stronger, so this makes it easier. Uh, to analyze. And uh, what you have to do then, as I said, you have strips, okay? So you have here the NH, uh, the proton, and go shipping here the carbon. And you can see there now you have peaks that are exactly the same can go shift. So now you can search for the right pair. So again, it's like a puzzle. <laughs> and uh, you can now see all the pairs, and then you can walk through. Uh, 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 the sequence. Uh, so here is like an, uh, you have here HNC, 
the Gen CA, so it will be the intra in the inter, and then you find the other one, then will be in, then you can walk through the sequence. Uh, not uh, sometimes the, the hydrogen can push it, it's not enough, so you can, you can make um, the sorry the alpha carbon uh, can push it, it's not enough. You can use the beta, so and, and then again you can walk through uh, the sequence using the difference in the shift. So here's just a, a, a scheme to show you that uh, fortunately the beta carbon uh, has a what you call a, a range a range of uh, dispersion and that uh, you can use that to assign your protein. So, and then again, I'm showing here a video um, spectrum to, uh, to show you how you can walk through the sequence. And then by the end of the day, you have uh, the structure, you can put all that restraints, and again, you need that triple resonance experiment uh, to make uh, your assignments, but then all the calculations are mainly based on Okay. And uh, this is another example that we are doing now in the lab. It's a, a, a small protein, it's a virgin from pollen, and it's a different to Mike. And that's kind of uh, so it has a different fold and a polypropylene rich domain. So you can see here that it has <coughs> several prolines and we can uh, immediately uh, think that it's very hard to, to assign because you expect a very small chemical sheet dispersion because most of these uh, amino acids are feeling uh, more or less the same environment so the chemical sheet dispersion will be very low and um, but it, so okay so we did all those experiments and we here get to the cube and uh, of course we all use uh, this kind of uh, analysis using the strip. <coughs> and this is a software developing called Fish Lab. So it's much easier to, to walk through. And, help, and also it's a semi-automatic uh, strategy, so it helps you uh, walking through the planes. <coughs> and again, the spectra, the real one. And uh, again, uh, so we could so the structure is not uh, ended yet. But still, you can see uh, the topology, and uh, it's uh, very similar to the other protein that I showed you. It has also the diacetyl bonds, the helices, and the beta. And uh, here, I want to point out that I, I find it very interesting because different, completely different proteins uh, with a very different uh, function, so they have the same uh, scaffold. So I, I believe that how it's present also toxins, so this may be a scaffold for hard work. So they have to be exported and uh, attack another cell, so I think this may represent a, a, a good scaffold. And also uh, here is the, the region of the protein, or the or by uh, mutagenesis, so as uh, it's supposed to be the IG interaction, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. So to, so, yeah, exposed uh, amino acids, so we believe that uh, it's probably the sign for interaction. And uh, so, uh, another thing I want to, to say uh, is that what you can do, so one thing that uh, you can do with easing anymore is to, is the structure determination. But there are many features that can be analyzed by NMR. And one of them is the interaction. So. These thyroidoxins are very ubiquitous for oxohemotases, uh, and they have many um, they have many uh, uh, targets in the cell. And uh, one thing that you, for instance, you can do since you have protein and you have all the assignments, one very easy experiment is oh sorry, is an HSQC. So what we did, this protein uh, uh, interacts with. Uh, thyroidoxin reductase, and we also know that the chemical shift uh, is, uh, can sense differences in the environment. So here I'm showing a figure from Bax and Spera, uh, from a paper from 1991, and uh, they noticed uh, comparing the chemical shift of the alpha carbon and the beta carbon, so they noticed that the chemical shift uh, it was different when the uh, the, the region was in alpha helices or beta sheets. 
so, so you can see this arrow means the random coil can go shift, and it clearly uh, it can be distinguished from the random coil value. So uh, not only for uh, secondary structure, but actually the chemical shift can, can fill the chemical environment of these amino acids. And it's a very interesting tool if you want to, to check, for instance, interaction. And here I'm showing a very simple experiment that's called uh, proton nitrogen 15 HSQC, where you can see it's a 2D scheme, where you can see here the proton chemical shift and here the nitrogen chemical shift. And for a protein, so you expect to have uh, the number of amide protons in the protein, so it will be represented here by, by a, a peak. And if you have the assignment, of course, you know exactly uh, which uh, uh, amino acid each peak represents. So if you use uh, the protein-free solution or with a target, uh, in, 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 uh, you can now check which region is a strongly binding. This is what we did. And then for the two proteins, you can then map the difference uh, that happened upon binding. So it's a very simple experiment. So it takes a uh, few minutes and it's very interesting to check uh, interaction. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit about uh, a very uh, powerful, I think, uh, um, uh, thing that you can do with NMR that is not dynamic. So NMR one very important thing is that you can probe uh, dynamics in, in a very large time scale. So that's what I wanted you to, to show now. So and uh, so why study dynamics is anymore? So here uh, I'm showing, uh, I can see it, but okay, I can't find it. So here I have uh, a graphic showing the relaxation rates. So T1 and T2 in another uh, feature that's the ethylnuclear enolite. And here, I don't know if you can see, but uh, T1 and T2 values change with the correlation time. So here is a simulation with using a rigid buffer, but still we can see that both the times uh, can uh, change with the correlation time. That means if you measure T1 and T2, you can then have information about these dynamics. Here is the correlation time. Uh, so what is T1 and T2? So just to uh, so T1 will be the time that the magnetization takes to uh, come back in the Z direction. So it's called uh, longitudinal relaxation rate. And T2, it's called uh, <coughs> transverse relaxation rate. So it's the time that the magnetization disappears in the XY plane. So this is a typical uh, experiment. Apple, then we need to measure it. So this will be the value of T2. So both uh, relaxation times can be used to, uh, to study dynamics. And uh, as I said, so here we have the formula, and uh, you can see that R1 and R2, uh, um, the two relaxation times, right, they correlate with the spectral density function, and then they can be correlated with dynamics. How? Uh, so the spectral density function is the FT of the autocorrelation function. That means that this find the strength of the motion per frequency. <coughs> so what you have to do then is to measure the values of R1 and R2 and try to correlate with the uh, spectral density function and then with the dynamics. And uh, just for simplicity, we usually use the pair nitrogen proton because uh, uh, so we, we study the relaxation of the nitrogen 15 because we know the, the main path for relaxation. So it has a, a hydrogen attached or uh, bound to it. So you know that this is the main uh, relaxation path. So you can. Uh, measuring the relaxation of the nitrogen, try to correlate to the dynamic of this, uh, the backbone, this region. 
So the relaxation has uh, many, um, uh, how can you say, uh, many um, interactions that do to many interactions. So uh, the two most important are like all the gold and chemical shift and an uh, anisotropy for nucleus uh, uh, with half, with uh, spin half. And uh, so let's so to extract this information, there are many um, um, strategies that you can use. And the most famous one was the one proposed by the Paris Apple. So and it's called model free formalism. Uh, this model free means that you don't need the model and need to fit your to fit your data. And uh, uh, this model, so here we have uh, the result you expect for if it, uh, uh, it's a, a rigid rotor, but uh, the data using protein, so we are not compatible with that. So what happens is that in the model free formalism, you include another uh, uh, movement, so that will be one in the nanosecond time scale that will describe the total correlation time of the protein. And uh, this model includes another one that in, in this model, this uh, NH factor will be described by a cone in which the angle of this cone will be the other parameter and then uh, another time that's now in the picosecond time scale. So using this model, we're going to have one tau m for the whole protein, for the other the, the protein, and another for each NH. And uh, it's interesting uh, to mention, so these other parameters will go from zero to one, so one will be uh, with no movement. And uh, usually in protein, this other parameter does not very much and goes around 0 0.8, 0 0.9, just decrease a little bit into 0.6, uh, in, usually in the terminal, terminal and flexible regions. So it's interesting to note that it's quite uh, constant through the protein. Uh, only flexible regions will have uh, this parameter. So as I said, um, so it's just repeating what I just said. Uh, in 1990, another group uh, uh, of my score, the NIH, of the NIH, included another, another movement in the protein. So uh, although it was a great improvement, the, the model free formalism uh, uh, fit, still there are some regions of the protein that cannot be described by that formalism. So what they did, they include another movement in the protein and uh, that means that you have another one. So you have the, the peak of second time scale where you have another movement and uh, this was very useful to describe by movements and loops of proteins that occurs in the nanosecond time scale. So you can see that you can draw things in the nanosecond time scale and the picosecond time scale if you study the R2 and R1. So these are just column full sequence that we use to measure. So it's not. And uh, another thing that you uh, that can obtain from the relaxation measurements is actually the conformation exchange. So uh, if you have um, conformation exchange or a region of the protein that has a dynamic properties and this properties now occurs in the millisecond microcircle compound scale. You can also probe uh, these dynamics using what's called, uh, you can use the T2 because in the uh, 1 over uh, T2 will have a contribution of this uh, Rx that is the rate uh, of, of this dynamics. So measuring what we call the relaxation dispersion experiment, you can then probe this uh, relaxation and then that's now in the range of mini to microseconds. So you can see now that using NMR you can probe a wide range of uh, dynamics. And uh, now I want to, to show you some uh, examples using this strategy. And the first one is that protein I showed you before. So it's called uh, supplant defense that I mentioned uh, it has a helices and it has a beta. 
And uh, when we calculate the structure, you can see that some regions are well defined, and uh, there are two loops uh, that are not very uh, well defined. So one reason for that is that just because you don't have enough NOEs to restrain the region. But another property that can affect these, uh, these calculations will be the dynamics of the, this region. And here I'm showing the R1, R2, and extranuclear NOE. And uh, you can see that the values, the values are, are very, um, I would say, constant for most of the protein. And uh, you should remember that uh, that's so five pound uh, linked protein, so it's quite uh, stable. But there are some regions that you clearly see that uh, the dynamic properties are different. And here is this first, so this first region, sorry, here. Mm -hmm. And in the R2, there are some other things going on. Uh, as I mentioned before, R2 will have the contribution of this nanosecond time scale of movements, but also microsecond, millisecond. So that probably means that uh, a special or something different is going on. So when we use the Riparetabu uh, formalism, we will also include the Rx. Um, in the calculation, as I mentioned before, you can see that the S2 the other parameter does not change much on the, the protein. And uh, the Rx show the region exhibiting uh, conformation exchange. So we could see that these uh, two regions now are uh, um, uh, in exchange in the microsecond, millisecond time scale. And it's interesting because there is a glycine 12 here that has another parameter very small. So uh, this seems like a, a flexible point due to, due to the glycine, and this is probably due to some kind of exchange in the protein. Just to make it easier to understand, so these are the amino acids that are on the conformation of exchange, and they are exactly in this loop. So when you, a biochemist, when uh, we see this kind of features, we uh, immediately think about uh, binding regions because usually when you have binding regions, uh, they, are, they exhibit some kind of flexibility, some kind of dynamic properties. So what we did, we then, uh, just to see the results in another way, so if you plot R2 over R1, which is not R exchange, but you can see in this ratio, you can see the contribution of our exchange. So what we decided to do, we decided to use uh, um, our vesicles. And we included these vesicles, the supposed a receptor of the fungus membrane. So this protein can um, act in fungus membrane. And the putative or the proposed uh, target is this compound that's a ceramide that we call uh, CMH. So we made the vesicles with the CMH and we try to see if there is some uh, interaction in which region it was, uh, it was interacting. So first what we did, we analyzed the chemical shift. So you can see here the comparison with uh, PC. So we, we did the PC, CMH, that's that ceramide. And uh, we increased the concentration of, this is not ceramide, of protein. And uh, we try to see the chemical shift changes. And actually, there are some changes here uh, in, the, in these two loops, but also in other regions of the, pro the protein. So actually, the chemical shift uh, um, strategy was in composite. So you can see here that uh, here is the, the result dealing with the dynamics. So, uh, they really focus in one region, and the temporal shift the results show that it, it seems that the whole protein, although it has four glycophile groups, it seems that it's, it's changing a lot. So what we did then, so let's see if the dynamics of the protein will change upon binding. So here I'm showing the results with uh, the free PSP1. Again, this is the R2 I1 ratio, so here you can see the exchange contribution. And again, the first loop and the second loop. And then we added, so we, we studied the dynamics now in the presence of the CMH. 
And we can see that these stars represent resonance that uh, were broad beyond detection. And uh, you can see clearly that some regions, the dynamic changes. So in this first loop, it seems that uh, some of Mars has decreased the dynamics, the exchange, uh, at least in this time scale, and others seems to increase. So uh, this is something I uh, found very interesting. So maybe these um, these two loops. So we think that these two loops are involved in the in the interaction. So we plan that to study those binary genesis and change the amino acids. Mainly that blind thing that's right in, uh, close to this uh, uh, flexible region. So we plan to study it uh, in details. Uh, okay, so. Here you can see there are some things that increase the confirmation exchange and other decrease the confirmation exchange. So we believe that uh, they represent some kind of a drop on compensation. I'm sorry. So just summarizing this, this result, so uh, we think that uh, so this will be the confirmation exchange. We can see clear the, the, the results. Again, Cauchy's perturbation, so it's all over the protein. And uh, here we have the relaxation perturbation. So actually, if you study the, just the Ken Cauchy's perturbation, it's very hard to, to, to conclude anything. But we really believe that what is really changing, well, what's really contributing, or maybe what's really going to give us the results is the relaxation experience. And uh, here I want to, to bring to you uh, uh, what we think. Um, that's probably happening. So we have seen these uh, landscapes, energy landscapes. So uh, well, we think that the well, the induced defeat uh, theory is proposed that uh, it has a, a large uh, landscape, and upon binding, one conformation is stabilized. So this is mainly what we uh, think. But uh, in our uh, opinion. Uh, and it's also uh, it's uh, really proposed by it's, uh, I mean it's really developed by a uh, uh, Dort Kern and uh, she uh, she believes that she has data and we believe also that actu actually the protein is in uh, different conformations in solution and uh, one of them is then selected and uh, is able to bind and then we believe that the equilibrium then will shift towards this. About information, so we think that actually the protein, uh, this fluctuation in structure, is the main structural properties that really, uh, I mean, uh, related to function. So this flexibility is directly related to these binding uh, properties of the protein. And uh, I would like just briefly to show you another example that may also uh, points. Um, in this direction, and this is a PW2, it's called PW2, so it's an anticoxidal peptide, so it's a, uh, a peptide that acts uh, in the membrane, so it has, it's a activity against uh, imeris ibumina, that's a protozoa that acts, uh, that um, attacks chicken, causes a disease in chicken, and this peptide acts in the membrane, so what's interesting about it is that uh, it's, a, it's a small peptide, you can see here, it's well amino acids. It was selected by phage display, but although it was very small, it still has specificity. So it can act against the medium, but cannot act against other bacteria or uh, normal cells, etc. So there is something uh, in the structure, in the sequence that have the information about the specificity. So we went to study this uh, peptide, it was interesting. So it, uh, it's completely, well, uh, you cannot study it in solution, so it has no NOE, so let's say it's considered random in solution. And uh, in the presence of uh, in the, in my cells, in, S, in DBC my cells, you can see that it acquires uh, uh, conformation, so you have a, a stabilization of the structure. And uh, the overall structure is not very similar, but if you compare the, uh, uh, the region that's consensus, uh, that's important in the same time, 
that will be the WWR regions, you can see that they are similar uh, structures. So this we found interesting because although the whole overall structure is not similar, this region seems to, to have um, some kind of uh, uh, consensus. And uh, sorry, that. So we ask uh, the question, so uh, uh, we want to, to see if the peptide has been completely free in solution, and then it acquires a structure as an interface. So we free solution, as I said, there is no LOE, so this is typically what we call random coil. But then we thought, because these will have a very high entropy cost, combining, so we thought that it's not this case and uh, uh, we want to study the properties in solution. But if you put it in solution, you see no NOEs, then that's a problem to study for anima. You have no NOEs, the color cup is average to the random coil values, and then we decided to use a paramagnetic relaxation enhancement. So what that means, you label your peptide with a paramagnetic probe, and then uh, this paramagnetic probe will interfere with uh, the relaxation properties of the, uh, in this case we use hydrogen, in the hydrogen of the molecules. And then we want to see if this uh, range, if this interference was just close to the end terminal where the, the probe is, then it's more like extended, it's not extended, but uh, you know, it's completely flexible, or maybe it has some kind of curve or some kind of uh, more restricted uh, conformation. Then you're going to see uh, effect not only in the end terminal, but, but in the C terminal. So we did the experiments. As expected, you see the PW2R, that's the label, the spin label. We can see it has broad lines, different from the PW2 solution. This is what we expect, because now it's filling the probe. And then, if you measure then the delta R1, that the R1 of the BW2 plus minus the R2 BW2, so you're going to have the effect of the, the paramagnetic probe, you can then calculate the distance between the probe and the hydrogen. So if you study the R1 of one term uh, hydrogen, you can then uh, have the distance of this probe to the hydrogen. And then it's what we did, and here we have the primary sequence, all the hydrogens we studied, and the average distance between them. And here you can see the distance we measured. Okay. And then we want to compare, so we need to compare, and then we just generate a standard uh, um, structure and a random coil from 800 structures, just for comparison. So you can see, of course, the extended that the distance will increase from the end to the C terminal. And also in the random coil, of course, it's not completely extended, but you can see also that uh, what you expect is an increase in distance. And clearly, our data is not uh, very compatible with this, um, this structure. And then here, just to summarize, so we have the extended, the random coil, and our data was not compatible with that. But then, we just we decided to, to compare the structure, uh, the distances, sorry, the distances uh, obtained with the PW2 to act with the structure we calculated in SPS and DPC. And that was quite surprising. You can see there is some kind of uh, match between them. So I'm not uh, uh, saying that the structure is exactly the same, but you can clearly see that even free in solution, the structure of PW2 probably uh, has some kind of structural information that's then obvious in SPS, uh, that's stabilized in SPS and DPC. So what we conclude with this data is that actually um, the peptide is not completely random in solution, so it actually, actually it has some kind of uh, conformation, so it has some kind of stabilization in solution based uh, in the paramagnetic results. 
And uh, we did some uh, molecular dynamic simulation just to see what, uh, so here I'm showing the rubbish on the plots for all uh, amino acids of the sequence. Uh, it started, so we started with the uh, obstruction SPS and DPC, and uh, you can see that for some amino, oh, sorry, for some amino acids, uh, they just travel around the Hamashtanga plot, but for others, we can see that they stay uh, restricted in the, during the dynamics. So here's the other parameter that uh, we analyzed again. We got a similar um, conclusion. And then we decided that, okay, so uh, it seems that uh, it has some uh, restricted, uh, more restricted conformation than we expect. And then we decided to analyze using uh, our exchange uh, which amino acids would be uh, undergoing uh, conformation exchange in the microsecond, millisecond time scale. And then we did the experiment I mentioned before, that is the relaxation dispersion. So the idea then is to measure the, uh, the exchange rate. And in this kind of experiment, uh, what you expect is that, so you're pairing up here the spin one field strength. Okay, so you have a key R1 row. And then if you have no exchange, this value will be the same for all spin one field strength. And if you have any kind of exchange, you can see that this R1 will be modulated by the spin lock field. So this way you can know exactly which amino acid is undergoing conformation exchange. So you can see here the three different side chains. You can see here also the other uh, DNH, the amide hydrogen and close to it. So to summarize, so this is the region important for uh, function. So if you mutate, if you change these amino acids, you lose uh, the activity. So we could see 